Today we have a guest speaker from Max Planck Florida uh, Institute, just part of our campus up in Jupiter. Dr. Ken Dawson Scully is hosting, so I'm going to throw it to Ken. Thanks, Kate. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. McLean Bolton. Dr. Bolton received her PhD from Duke in 2000 in neurobiology. She worked as a research associate um, with a postdoctoral NRSA in Dr. Mike Ayler's lab, where then she moved through a number of startup companies as a senior scientist. Dr. Bolton then became a research assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics Neurology at Duke. And then in 2011, she then transitioned to the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience, where she became a research group leader and she focuses on the understanding alterations in neural circuits that underlie neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia and autism. She's a very active in, in administration as the chair of academic programs, and she's also a co-speaker for the International Max Planck Research School, shared between Max Planck Florida Institute and Florida Atlantic University. She also has a very active laboratory with several graduate students and technicians where she's well-funded by the Max Planck Society, she publishes regularly in high impact journals where the most recent papers were in 2020 in translational psychiatry and brain structure function. Take it away, McLean. So good afternoon. First, I wanted to thank Randy for inviting me and Ken for hosting me. And it's really great to have the opportunity to share my research with my neighbors, even if it is virtual. So my research is motivated by the need to find treatments to psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia. So I wanna first introduce schizophrenia so that we realize that I'm disease focused, it's not just basic research. And then I wanna give a uh, talk about a trio of projects that explore how schizophrenia rich genes um, may put the amygdala on overdrive. Okay, so schizophrenia is a complex chronic and severe mental illness that affects how a person thinks, feels, and acts. And the symptoms are divided into three categories, the positive symptoms or psychotic behaviors, cognitive symptoms, or, and negative symptoms, such as reduced emotions. So some examples of positive symptoms are hallucinations, which are perceived sensory experiences that occur in the absence of a sensory stimulus. It's like hearing voices that aren't there or seeing people that aren't there. And it can happen to any, in any senses, but it's most common in auditory. Um, delusions are another positive symptom. They're strongly held false beliefs that persist even when there's evidence to the contrary. So thinking someone that's placing thoughts in your mind or can control your thoughts or paranoid thoughts. And some thought disorders um, are considered positive symptoms like having great difficulty in organizing your thoughts or speaking in garbled words that have no meaning but sound like a language. There are also some movement disorders, some agitated repetitive body movements or catatonia in some patients. As far as negative symptoms, um, flat affect is, a, is one of the major ones. So reduced expression of emotions and via tone of voice and facial expression or gestures. Anhedonia or reduced feelings of pleasure in everyday life or avolition, a lack of motivation or elogia, or which is reduced speaking or less complicated patterns of speech. Patients have a lot of trouble with executive function or the poor ability to understand information and to be able to use it to make, a, make decisions and they have trouble with attention, focusing, keeping on task. They also have difficulty with working memory, or, you know, remembering information for immediate use. Um, so here are some statistics of schizophrenia. So 1% of the people in the United States and worldwide are affected with schizophrenia, and this is across the board. It doesn't vary by region. Um, males are 1.4 times more likely to be affected than females, and the average age of onset is 24 in males and 27 in females. And the life expectancy is reduced by 10 to 20 years in patients. And the annual cost of schizophrenia in the US alone is $90 billion. So clearly we need to understand what happens in the brain circuits and develop treatments that help people with the disorder. In their family. So how do we treat schizophrenia? So medication is of course the first line of defense. Um, counseling and social support groups can make a world of difference and kind of training your brain with cognitive behavioral uh, therapy to keep some of the symptoms in check can really minimize the need for a lot of medication. The primary medications, of course, are antipsychotics. The first generation antipsychotics were very strong dopamine receptor type 2 blockers, and the second generations have had a milder um, effect on D2 and have serotonin blocking as well, as well as many other things, but they're not perfect and they do not affect the, the negative or the cognitive symptoms. So what causes schizophrenia to develop? 
Well, it's very strongly genetic with environmental influences. So this graph helps me to think about that. This shows the concordance rate between different types of relatives for schizophrenia. So if you have a twin, if you're a monozygotic twin and one of the twins has schizophrenia, there's a 45% chance the other uh, will have it. If you have two schizophrenic parents, then the chance that the child will have it is over 35%. It goes down to 7% with siblings and spouses, which would be like the general population, is 1%. So clearly there's a genetic influence, but clearly that's not all. So there's environmental modifiers with genetic background. So many genetic loci and candidate genes have been identified for schizophrenia. There are examples of rare variants in genes where a single gene can make a major contribution, but by and large, the disorder is very polygenetic. So mutations in many genes that have small effects combined to create the conditions for developing schizophrenia. So this study here shows uh, the top candidate genes that were identified across many GWAS studies. We, there are some rare variants that um, have strong effects. So DISC1, which is a scaffolding protein, Neuregulin 1, which we'll talk about later, and the choline elemental transferase gene. Uh, they have a metabotropic glutamate receptor, an AMPA receptor, an NMDA receptor, the dopamine receptor, um, a calcium channel, this norexin 1, and the receptor for neuregulin 1. So these are genes that have been identified in, across the board as being rare mutations that can contribute a lot in certain cases. Um, recently, the, there was a, a study that identified 108 schizophrenia candidate loci. And one interesting thing that they found was that the major histocompatibility locus was way above everything else. And this was a bit surprising in the study. Um, and subsequent work has identified the C4 complement uh, protein as in this area. And that, that's particularly interesting with respect to synaptic pruning. Okay, so there are several hypotheses about what is imbalanced at a network level in schizophrenia and potential molecular mechanisms that undergo this imbalance. So they're not mutually ex exclusive and we hope someday they'll merge into one complete picture of the etiology of schizophrenia. But the main ideas are excessive mesolemic dopamine, excessive spine pruning, particularly in the prefrontal areas, NMDA hyperfunction, and oscillatory rhythm imbalances and oxidative um, stress. So synaptic connections continue to form at a high rate throughout child childhood. And then there's a period of synapse elimination in adolescence. And then even it gets kind of levels out into normal adulthood. But with, they found that in schizophrenia, the period of adolescent spine pruning is much uh, more profound than in normal individuals. So you can see this on the bottom graphs here where there's a, this shows dendritic spines in the prefrontal cortex on layer three, and you see more spines in the control than the schizophrenic patients. And you can see this summarized in the middle here. The, the yellow is the controls and the red is the schizophrenic group. It's interesting in light of the fact that the C4 complement protein was identified by the schizophrenia consortium. And that's involved in microglial assisted synaptic engulfment. So um, the C4 protein binds to a synapse and tags it for microglia to come and eat the synapse. So with respect to the hypothesis of increased mesolimbic dopamine, um, so this circuit is important for reward and motivation and salience. So here, the, here are the neurons in the, the VTA and their dopaminergic neurons, and they project to the nucleus accumbens, the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala. And they receive inhibitory projections from the ventral pallidum and the nucleus accumbens. And somehow in this loop, the hypothesis in schizophrenia is that uh, there's too much dopamine released in the nucleus accumbens and not enough in the prefrontal cortex. Why this evolves is unknown, but that's the, the theory and a lot of the antipsychotics are based on the principle of blocking this excess mesolimbic dopamine. Another theory about what goes wrong with brain circuits is NMDA receptor hyperfunction. So glutamate, as you know, is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. When glutamate 
vesicles are released, um, glutamate goes across the synaptic cleft and binds to AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. And NMDA receptors are particularly important for brain rhythms because they have a, they are often expressed and drive the fast parvovumin neurons in the brain. And one of the original reasons why people thought that NMDA receptor hypofunction could be involved in schizophrenia was that drugs such as PCP and ketamine um, block the NMDA receptors and they cause behaviors that are similar to the positive symptoms of schizophrenia in normal subjects and make the symptoms of schizophrenia patients worse, like hallucinations, delusions, and hyperactivity. There's also a variation in the NMDA receptor gene associated with um, schizophrenia. And if you make a mouse that knock, you knock down the NMDA receptor, you also may have some of the positive symptoms. So brain rhythms are caused by synchronized firing of many neurons. The brain has oscillations at many frequencies from the low delta waves to the high gamma range, which is 30 to 100 hertz, or 400 actually. The, the power of these rhythms changes with the attentional state and during sleep. Synchronization of these rhythms between different brain regions is important for integrated processing of information for memory consolidation. And gamma power is impaired during cognitive tasks and schizophrenia. So these are pictures of the EEG recordings um, when schizophrenia and control patients are performing some kind of working memory task. And you can see that there's reduced um, activation or power of the gamma rhythms in the schizophrenia patients shown in the darker blue colors. And this is, these are the difference plots. But you know, what about the amygdala in schizophrenia? In, in schizophrenic patients, particularly those with paranoid schizophrenia, fear and anxiety is absolutely debilitating. But there's really little work that's been done on how the amygdala is affected in schizophrenia. Um, there are studies that, that hint that this could be an issue, but just if you observe the behavior, you, you would realize that this is something that, that should be studied. So this study shows that there's increased resting state blood flow to the left amygdala in schizophrenic patients. So the orange are schizophrenic patients, the blue are controls, and the green are actually non-paranoid schizophrenic patients. And so there's an increase in the basal activation of the amygdala in these patients. So it's like they're slightly on alert for, for fearful stimuli. But there's a decreased activation of the amygdala during um, a, a task where you're trying to judge trustworthiness from facial expressions. So here, again, the orange patients are the schizophrenia patients, and you saw show less activation than the controls. And this may be because they're already, the, the basal activity is already so high that they don't have much room left to activate it further when something relevant um, it comes into play. There's also reduced functional connectivity between the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex in patients. So in this task, um, the subjects were told, they were shown a picture of a face, and then they were shown two other faces and they had to, faces, and they had to pick which one was the same face as the one they were shown before. And they had two blocks. One block was emotional faces and one were neutral faces. And interestingly, on the bottom here, the, the schizophrenic patients had difficulty with the accuracy of the test only in the emotional block, not in the neutral block. So it was the, the emotions of the faces were bothering them to the extent they were having difficulty um, performing the task. And they, when they did this, they were, were measuring also the functional connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, and they found um, reduced connectivity in the dorsal angle, the dorsal, um, what, what is it that I'm trying to say? Ang the cingulate cortex and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and the rostral medial prefrontal cortex. So, and you can see that here in, with the um, patients versus the controls. So, so given the evidence that the amygdala isn't functioning properly in schizophrenia, I wanted to look at the amygdala function in a couple of knockout models of top schizophrenia candidate genes. So the first project I want to talk about is the investigation of amygdala circuit function and behavior in the Norexin-1-alpha knockout mouse model. And this is the work 
from Douglas Asede, he was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, and Ashnal Joseph, a postback fellow in the lab, who was also a former FAU student. So norexin is a presynaptic protein that is on in the synaptic cleft. It's important for um, the synapse formation and stabilization and function. It's present at both excitatory and inhibitory synapses. And it binds transsynaptically to a number of postsynaptic partner proteins, the neuroligins, the LRTMs, the cerebellums, lactobacillus, and dystroglycan. It has six different alternate splicing sites, so it can be put together in many different ways. And with that kind of specificity, you can imagine how different synapses in different brain regions could use the norexins different, differentially. So they have found a copy number of variations associated with various um, psychiatric disorders with the norexin gene. So in 0.18% of schizophrenic patients and 0.5% of autism patients. And those are actually high numbers for a rare gene. So a knockout model of norexin 1 has some of the behaviors that you might expect for a mouse or a rat who was behaving with some of the symptoms of schizophrenia, although it's hard because they're mouse. Um, so they had the norexin knockouts has difficulty with sensor motor, sensory motor um, integration, nest building, self-grooming, motor learning. They have increased aggression. They have increased startle, decreased instrumental and spatial learning, and decreased social fear learning. So Douglas and Asnell examined a classical cued fear conditioning in the norexin one alpha knockout mice. So how the test works is the first day you, you put the mice in the cage just to get used to it. And the second day you pair a tone with a shock several times. And you, you pair, there's another tone that you don't pair, so it's, a, so it's not used to the shock. So they learn to freeze when they're, they learn to associate the tone with the shock. Then the next day, you test them in a different context and you just play the tone and not the shock and you see if they still remember the tone was, was fearful by freezing. So in the Norexin's um, knockout mice, when it, on, during the fear learning phase, there was a trend towards decreased learning, um, but it wasn't significant. But on the next day, after they had a chance to calm down and recollect their experience, the control mice remembered that the tone was a pair with the talk because they, they shocked because they froze. But the norexin 1A knockouts, they, they did not learn as well to associate the tone with the shock. So fear learning um, is associated with the amygdala, amygdala circuitry. So um, this is a simplified diagram of the amygdala circuit. So in fear learning, you have um, information about the CS the, coming in from the auditory system through the, the salmus and the cortex and entering the lateral amygdala. The unconditioned stimulus or pain comes in to the amygdala through the thalamus and through the LA. And during fear learning, the synapses here, among other places, are potentiated to learn to associate the tone with the shock. There are other areas in the, in the, within the circuit that are also altered in fear learning, but that's the classic one. Um, from the LA, the, it's a kind of a linear circuit where information flows from the LA to the BA, then to the central amygdala and out to the hypothalamus and brainstem to affect the fear behavior. There is um, top-down emotional control from the medial prefrontal cortex and contextual information and and kind of salience information from the nucleus accumbens, and that's the fear circuit. Okay, so in these norexin one knockout mice, um, they, they had the fear deficit. So what we wanted to do was to investigate what in the amygdala was changing to underlie this deficit they had in fear learning. So we wanted to look at this because the medial prefrontal cortex to amygdala circuitry is weakened or could be weakened 
in schizophrenia from top-down control. We looked at the synapse between the medial prefrontal cortex and the basal amygdala. So how we did this is we expressed channel rhodopsin, um, which is a protein that when you shine a light on this channel, it opens and conducts cations and it can be used to depolarize neurons. So it's a very useful tool for us. So we injected this channel rhodopsin into the prefrontal cortex, and then the terminals from the channel rhodopsin um, went on down and synapsed on the BA. And the purple here is a cell that we were patch clamping in the BA. So when we patch clamp the neuron in the BA and shine the light on to activate the channel rhodopsin, these synapses are activated and you see um, a postsynaptic current response in the neuron. And these are excitatory responses. Um, so one way to determine how strong a presynaptic part of the synapse is, is to look at what we call pair pulses. So if you stimulate a neuron to make to release glutamate and you have a postsynaptic response, and then you do it again 50 milliseconds later, if, if the synapse is a high probability of release synapse, then all the vesicles or most of the vesicles can be released the first time, and there aren't that many left over for the second guy. So it's a measure, so that the PP paired pulse response is a measure of presynaptic function. So we've, what we found was that in the norexin knockouts, this second pulse was much smaller than the first pulse. So, and this could mean either that they were, it's a high probability of release synapse, or that they just didn't have enough vesicles to, to follow along in the beginning. So at any rate, he has reduced presynaptic ability to follow a train of synaptic stimuli. And that's summarized here in, in this bar graph. So we looked at the same neurons, but we stimulated in the, the lateral amygdala to see what the synapses from the lateral amygdala to the base of the lateral amygdala were doing. And here, when we stimulate these synaptic responses, you could see that the second pulse is almost as large as the first, and it wasn't changed in the knockouts. And that's summarized here. So at two different synapses on the same neurons, norexin is having a very different effect in terms of the presynaptic function. But what about on the postsynaptic side? So the, the postsynapse has different types of AMPA receptors, I mean, of, of glutamate receptors. There are NMDA receptors and there are AMPA receptors, to name a few. The NMDA receptors have this really unusual feature in that they are blocked by magnesium at minus 70. When you depolarize the neuron, it pops the magnesium out and then the, and the calcium and sodium can come into the NMDA receptors. So how we measure how many, what percentage of the synaptic current is carried by AMPA and NMDA is we hold the cell at different voltages. So here we're holding the cell at minus 70 and we're looking at the AMPA current going down and at plus 40, it's the AMPA current plus the NMDA current, but we, the AMPA current's very fast. So if you measure out here, it's just the NMDA current. So what you see here in the knockouts in the synapse from the MPFC to BA is that there is a major decrease in the AMPA to NMDA ratio. And we don't know from this information whether this is due to the AMPA receptors being smaller or the NMDA receptors uh, being bigger because it's just a ratio. When we looked at the LA to BA synapses and did the same thing, looking at AMPA receptor current here and NMD up here, they were exactly the same. So again, the synapses from the medial prefrontal to the BA are behaving very differently than the LA to BA when you knock out in the Rexin one. So to try to figure out the question about whether the AMPA receptors are smaller or the NMD receptors are bigger, we did what we call a light response curve. So here we have our optogenetic stimulation of the medial prefrontal cortex fibers, and we just turn the light intensity up, and we crank it up. And then you can see that all across the board, the knockout amper receptor currents are smaller than the control. 
So this indicates that we have decreased AMP receptors in the knockout. So the other thing that we wanted to check was to look at inhibition onto these same neurons. So um, what we did here is we, we can hold the cells in such a way that we can put the reversal potentials at, to hold for minus 70 is the reversal potential for chloride. So when you're going down, it will be only amp receptor currents. And if you're holding it at zero, the excitatory currents are at reversal potential, so you can only see the inhibitory. So those are details, but the short of it is that excitatory transmission is down and inhibitory transmission is up. And what you can see in this case is that the, in the knockouts, inhibition is just decimated. The, those are tiny little yellow curves in, in the knockout, and they're tiny both at the MPFC to um, BA synapse and the LA to BA synapse. So here we have the, the EPSCs are the same and the IPSCs uh, are decreased in amplitude in the knockout. So from that, we don't know if inhibition is tiny because the excitatory drive to this inner neurons are smaller or because the inner neurons synapsing on the next neuron are smaller. So what we wanted to do was to take the excitatory drive out of the equation. So here, what we did was we expressed channel rhodopsin in the cell bodies of the uh, neurons in the BA, and we shined the, the light on and measured the inhibitory responses. And, and what we found was that the probability that one um, inhibitory neuron was connected to an excitatory neuron was reduced threefold in the knockout. And then when you integrate the currents, that reflects the threefold reduction in, in the amplitude of inhibition. So to summarize this project, um, the synapse from the medial prefrontal cortex to the basal amygdala, it provides executive control of fear emotions. The synapse is, is unusually dependent on the schizophrenia susceptibility gene, norexin 1 alpha. Um, it has a reduced presynaptic capacity to release glutamate at high frequency. It has weaker AMPA receptor mediated postsynaptic responses. Um, inhibition in, this, in the amygdala is basically decimated by the loss of norexin, and there are fewer inhibitory connections onto the BA principal neurons. So I wanted to switch gears and talk about uh, the next project that I wanted to present. And this is a project is called Apical Paracapsular Intercalated Cell Cluster, a novel sensory regulator in the amygdala. This is a pretty esoteric <laughs> project, I have to admit. So this project was uh, led by Douglas Asedi, again, a postdoctoral fellow, and predominantly the work was done by Divyesh Dodepanani, an FAU medical student who also was an undergraduate at FAU. Um, Abigail Chavez, who um, was a post, uh, was a FAU honors graduate and hopefully will come back and work in my lab in the future. Uh, she did all the, the morphological analysis. Carolyn Von Walter, who is in my lab now and hopefully will stay forever um, as a graduate student. And she did a lot of the surgeries and uh, some of the imaging and morphological analysis. So, the ITCs are clusters of inhibitory neurons that gate information flow into and within the amygdala. Um, ITCs are potential therapeutic targets for schizophrenia. At least I think so. I don't think anyone else has ever said it, but I think they would be a good target. So um, anyway, so the inhibition is a very important part of the amygdala functions. And the, the neurons within the amygdala fire at low basal rates and under normal conditions. And then when something that's relevant for emotional response, the breaks are inhibitory breaks are removed and the synapses can undergo plasticity and they can have responses to, to fear. So the ITCs are interesting because they receive uh, dense dopaminergic input that hyperpolarizes them through D1 receptors. So when the VTA synapse is on the ITCs, um, the inward rectifier potassium channel opens and it hyperpolarizes the cell, making them less excitable. 
So each cluster has a, a lot of specific connections within the amygdala and receives specific information from outside. For example, the medial um, paracapsular ITCs receive information from the thalamus, the medial prefrontal cortex, and uh, several other cortical areas, and the LA, and they project to the central lateral amygdala and the BA and the medial cluster. The lateral ITCs receive sensor information at, from the sensory cortex and the entorhinal cortex, and they project to LA and BA. The main ITC cluster receives information from the medial prefrontal medial IT, ITCs and the central medial um, nucleus and, and also um, the hippocampus and insular cortex. So, but what about the apical ITCs? So they're a tiny little cluster up at the top on top of LA, and it's missing in most of the diagrams that you see in, of amygdala circuitry. And it's missing because we don't know anything about it. So we wanted to study the APITCs and, and try to figure out um, who it's connected to and what it's doing. So in order to do this, we needed to find out who the presynaptic partners of the APITCs were. So one way to do this is to use a monosynaptic rabies chasing. Um, so Monosynaptic rabies chasing is nice because it takes advantage of a natural property of this rabies virus to jump across the synapse and infect the presynaptic terminal. And so then you could identify everybody that was presynaptic to that cell, um, but you have to stop it from reproducing and going back further until the whole brain is full of virus. So the way this has been done is that they remove one of the necessary proteins, the glycoprotein G protein, and they also pseudotype the virus so it has an, an avian coat protein envelope A so that it will only infect things that have the receptor to the envelope protein, and that's here. So if you use your, your first you inject a helper virus that, give, that adds in the delta G and then and has the, the TVA receptor for the envelope protein. Then if you wait and let that express for two weeks and then uh, deliver a rabies virus that has this envelope A coding, it can internalize into the cell. It can go about its life cycle and then hop a synapse and then transfect the synaptic partner with whatever you have cloned into it. So we use this approach to try to figure out who was, who were the partners to the APITCs. Um, so we injected the APITCs with our helper virus and then two weeks later with our rabies virus. And here you can see the starter cells in blue and then the presynaptic partners are in green. So what we found um, was some things were expected and some things were not. So we found the, um, the PIN and MGM nucleus, which conveys, is expected because it would convey auditory information um, that was necessary for the fear learning. We found some midline nuclei that would be are useful because they, uh, they're, they convey limbic information uh, to the amygdala and to and from the medial prefrontal cortex. So we also found, um, so then we went through and checked to see if these things were actually connected. So, and how we did this was we injected channel rhodopsin into the presynaptic partner, which in this case was in the thalamus in the MGM pin, and then the channel rhodopsin expressed, and we made slices, and we patch clamped the APITCs, and we shined the light on the terminals to see if we got a synaptic response. So here, so here you see the injection site, here you see the channel rhodopsin expressing axons going over near the APITCs, and, if you, and here's a blow up showing them right next door, and here are the synaptic responses. And we found that 100% of the APITCs receive connections from the pin nucleus. We also found um, a number of limbic relevant association areas. 
Um, we found the insular cortex, piriform cortex, endopiriform colostrum, auditory cortex, temporal association cortex, the amygdala hippocampal area, ventral hippocampus, and interrhinal cortex. So now we're in the process of going and checking and seeing which of those are actually connected and which are just um, artifacts of our rabies process. So, um, so here we injected our channel rhodopsin in the temporal association cortex and again let it express for three or four weeks. And you can see the, again, the axons coming through near the APITC and the patch clamped excitatory responses. And in this case, we found that 58% of the ITCs received uh, synaptic con connections from the temporal cortex. We also found um, synaptic connections from the insular cortex. 60% of the neurons that we checked were responsive, so 60% of the APITCs received synaptic inputs um, for, for insular cortex. And and in the interrhinal cortex, we found that 100% of the APITCs uh, received connection from the interrhinal cortex. So now we know some of the areas that project to the APITCs. Now we wanted to find out where they project to. So how these experiments were done was we patch clamped the APIT neurons and we filled the electrode with biocytin and then reacted it with streptavidin and that was conjugated to a fluorescent dye. And then we imaged with the confocal and then traced the axon in a program called Neurolucida. And what we found um, was that 33% of the APITCs projected within the cluster here, 35% of the APITCs projected to LA, and 23% of them projected striatum, and 10% projected striatum and LA. So now we wanted to just look at how they were functioning within the um, amygdala circuit. So um, APITC, we found form inhibitory synapses on LA principal neurons. So here, if you put a, an opsin, a fast opsin, in this case, Kronos, in the APITCs, and you shine a light on them, and you record from a principal neuron, you see an inhibitory response. So we find that they what they do is they form inhibitory connections on LA principal neurons. Then we showed that if you can drive, so since we think that the thalamus projects to the APITCs as a major input, we wanted to know whether those afferents from the thalamus can drive the APITCs to fire and activate the inhibitory synapses onto the principal neurons. So here we shined a light on the channel drops and terminals and recorded from the principal neuron and we found a disynaptic inhibitory current. So in this kind of verifies the circuit that thalamus drives the APA to ITCs to inhibit the LA principal neurons. So then we wanted to see, well, what happens, how do they participate in fear learning? So we know that they're in a position to integrate information from a, a number of higher order cortical association areas and receive direct sensory imp input relevant for fear from the thalamus. So how do they work in the fear circuit? So we did um, fear conditioning on m mice and then we met and they learned the fear conditioning as normal. Here's the, they freeze when they learn to associate the tone with the shock and the next day they remember it. But what we did was in addition to training them, then we sacrificed the mice at different time points and looked at how this, the synapses onto the APITCs from the thalamus were um, changed by the experience of learning the fear. So here is our, so, the, so again, these traces are amper currents going down and NMDA receptor currents going up. This is like the, just the control, home cage control animals. And um, we find that they have, this is their, their amphocurrents and this is the paired pulse ratio between the amphocurrents and here's your NM currents. So in the fear condition mice though, if you, you look here, the paired pulse ratio is, is different. So 
the, incre the increase the probability of release because the paired pulse ratio decreased. So that's shown here in this bar graph. Um, and if you, in another control where you don't shock them or it, with, at this frequency of tone, there was no change in their um, paired pulse ratio. And, but, but by the time the next day, the fear memory, this change in the paired pulse ratio was back to normal. So that was a transient synaptic change during, associated with the acquisition of fear, but it was not present in part of the fear memory. However, if you look at the NMDA currents in the same situation, so here's the control and here's the fear condition, the NMD currents um, got smaller and in, in they, were, they remained smaller in the um, memory case. So th this was a permanent change in the AMPA to NMDA ratio in these neurons with fear conditioning. So in summary, um, the APITCs are strongly driven by sensor information related by the thalamus. They receive information from a diverse range of higher order cortical association areas. The APITCs project to LA and they gain information entering this emotional processing hub. And they also project to the striatum, gaining motivational drive with emotional salience. Um, and it, it's regulated by dopamine. So I have one final project to quickly go through if we have enough time. Um, this project was um, done again by Douglas Asedi and three students contributed, Saba Ali, James Oko, and Diviesh Dorepanini. And the, it's about the functional consequences of ERB4 deletion in amygdala intercalated cells and the implications for schizophrenia. So neuregulin is a member of the EGF superfamily of growth factors. It's expressed in the brain during development in adulthood. It's the dominant receptor for neuregulin in the brain. And upon binding to its ligand neuregulin, the receptor dimerizes and autophosphorylates and activates the PI3 kinase and the RAF MAP kinase pathways, which are involved in cell growth and cell proliferation and, and differentiation. The herb receptor also uh, is involved in keeping NMDA receptors at the synapse by binding to a scaffolding protein that holds them under the synapse. Um, as we mentioned before, neuregulin and ERB4 are highly um, top candidate genes for schizophrenia. Um, in schizophrenia patients, or neuregulin 1 expression is increased and ERB4 is hyperphosphorylated. And there are a lot of um, ERB4 splice pattern um, alterations in, in patients. Um, removal in of ERB4 and PV neurons leads to a schizophrenia mouse phenotype um, in a number of, of tests. And ERB is expressed in GABAergic interneurons, um, PV neurons, CCK neurons, and VIP neurons, and in GABAergic projection neurons. Um, in the ITCs, and in also in dopaminergic neurons and noradrenergic neurons. So it's involved in the migration, differentiation, and function of GABA neurons, and it sets the window for visual system critical period plasticity. It's involved in ga gamma rhythms and theta rhythms and synchrony between the ventral hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. So one of the striking features about this herb protein is, is it's expressed at very high levels in the intercalated nucleus um, of the amygdala. So we really wanted to look at knocking out the herb before gene specifically in this population of neurons and see what it affected. So in this case, we're looking at the MPITCs um, and they receive strong projection from the thalamus and the medial prefrontal cortex. They project to BA in the central lateral um, in nucleus. So how we did this is we crossed the, the herb for knockout flox mice with a DR1 Cree line that is expressed specifically in the intercalated cells and is the main cluster. And in also some scattered populations in the nucleus accumbens and the clostrum. 
So when we looked at the behavior of these knockouts, um, they had deficits in sociability. So they, in the control mice, they prefer to spend time with um, another mouse compared to the empty cage. If you put them in, in the center here, they'll go visit the mouse more than they would visit the empty cage. Um, and the norexin knockouts didn't seem to care whether it was an empty cage or a mouse. And we also checked social novelty. And so if you have a mouse that he knows and a new mouse, the normal mice generally like to go explore the new mouse. So they spend more time with the unfamiliar mouse in the controls. The norexin knockouts didn't care if he was old or new, it's all the same to him. So they had some social deficits. They were also hyperactive in the open field test. So when we looked at fear conditioning in these guys, um, we found that they, they, had a, they were okay in terms of the training, but they couldn't remember the fear learning the next day. They, didn't, they couldn't remember to, that the tone was scary and that they needed to freeze. They also um, didn't forget, right? So, so if you normally, if you play a tone that you have previously shocked a mouse with over and over again, and you don't shock them, they they learn that this is not dangerous anymore, so they stop freezing. But these guys, uh, um, the, the norexin knockouts, kept on freezing. They didn't learn to, to it was okay. And this you might expect of schizophrenia. So what we, we we wanted to look at what was going on in the MPITCs in these mice, and we found when we looked at spontaneous synaptic transmission, we found that ex excitatory transmission seemed to be okay in terms of AMPA receptor minis, but the knockouts had larger individual responses to GABA released spontaneously. So they had larger inhibitory quantal amplitude. So we looked um, at, at this process to see if it was, when you evoke the stimulation, so if you stimulate the thalamic afferents to the MPITCs and you patch clamp them, and you do a light response curve, if you look at excitatory transmission on the bottom, you turn the light up and the responses get bigger and they look about the same in the mutants in orange compared to the, the wild type in black. But as you sh increase the light intensity and look at the inhibitory currents, it's clear that the inhibitory currents are much larger all across the board in the knockouts, and that's shown here in the summary. So, um, so they're getting too much inhibition onto these neurons. We also wanted to look at the AMPA to NMDA ratio in, in the mutants in the same way and, and the paired pulse pulse ratio in the same way that we did in the other projects. And what we found was that there, there was no difference in the paired pulse ratio, indicating there wasn't an issue with the presynaptic functioning, but there was an increase in the AMPA to NMDA ratio um, in the mutants. So here we wanted to also find out whether it was due to um, a, a change in the AMPA current or the change in the NMDA current. So when we did the light response curve for just AMPA EPSCs, it was the same in the control and the knockouts, and, but the NMDA receptor current was decreased. So we wanted to find out ultimately what do these synaptic pathologies have to do with how this synapse is going to behave in a fear situation. So these neurons undergo LTP during fear learning, and so we did an LTP protocol on, well, from the lamp gafferents to the MPITCs, that you have a high frequency stimulus that would normally give LTP. And you can see that in wild type mice, they get LTP, the open circles are normal LTP, um, but in the mutants, they didn't. It's in, the, it's in fact LTD. If you block inhibition, which helps with the depolarization of the neurons and allows an MDA currents to um, open, then the wild type mice had larger LTP and the mutants had some level of LTP. And this is summarized um, here, showing that the wild type have LTP, the knockouts have LTD. If you block inhibition, the wild type gets bigger and the knockout is slightly rescued. <laughs> 
So in summary, they, they do not have normal learning plasticity at this synapse, that would, and this would have an effect on fear. So to summarize this project, the deletion of ERB4 in the ITCs results in hyperactivity and fear learning and social interaction deficits, an increased quantile amplitude of inhibitory synapses onto the MPITCs, an increased strength of feed-forward inhibition of, of MPITCs by thalamic afferents, and decreased NMDA receptor-mediated synaptic currents in the thalamic synapses onto MPITCs, and impaired LTP of thalamic synapses onto MPITCs due to enhanced inhibitory gating. And the overall summary is that disinhibition of the base lateral amygdala is a common endophenotype among two mouse models of schizophrenia. In Norexin 1A knockout mice, feed forward inhibition from the MPSC and LA to BA is profoundly compromised. And in the ERB4 ITC knockout mice, aberrant enhancement of inhibition and a lack of LTP of excitatory thalamic afferents to the MPITCs leads to dis disinhibition of the BA. And ITCs may be a beneficial target for developing therapies for schizophrenia. So, and I just want to thank the members of my lab for their dedication and support and team spirit. It's a it's a really great place to be because they're all so hardworking and great. So thanks and thanks for listening. So if anybody would like to ask any questions of Dr. Bolton, we invite you to use the hand raising mechanism in Zoom on your screens. Uh, McLean, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the um, contributions of uh, dopamine signaling to the circuits that you mentioned. And I wondered if in any of the projects that you described, uh, you've tried to manipulate uh, dopamine signaling either in the animal or in the slice to take a look at differences in, um, say, dopaminergic modulation of synaptic function in the mutants? That's a really great idea. So we've, we've verified that in the APITCs, they, those neurons are inhibited by dopamine as expected. But we haven't tried to um, see if we can enhance any of the pathologies or can wreck them by dopamine. That's a really, that's a really cool thought. Um, it's something that I'm going to write down. Right. And, and you know, maybe you know, with the, them, but validity, more validity to the model. If it's yeah, and with antagonists that might yeah. be therapeutic and just sort of to see about parallels. I think that'd be really, really cool. And one, one other little quick question. Have you looked at all at sex effects that might um, distinguish um, their responses at all? So I didn't show some of the data in the herb um, mice. There, there were some difference in the social phenotypes with the females versus the males. I think they were much slightly more sensitive to some of the, the, the social behaviors, but I haven't um, spent a lot of time classifying. We do, the, in general, do the behaviors on the males. Great, thanks, beautiful work. Hi, yeah, I don't know, can I just jump in here? Or? Yes, go right ahead. <laughs> it's Claire. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, it's kind of actually a follow-up uh, question to Randy's question, and it's looking at the opposite side. Have you looked at the glutamate uh, effect uh, on uh, dis, uh, disinhibiting the, or yes, disinhibiting the GABA uh, response? So, so have we systematically manipulated the glutamate levels? Yeah, with your with with some of these knockout mice, I think it might be interesting to see you know what would happen. So if your if your NMDA receptor is dysfunctioning, and it's causing an inhibition, it's not releasing glutamate into the uh, GABA or uh, GABAergic system. Yeah, so I think pushing the system with, by doing uh, perhaps you know high frequency stimulation at different places to to get at that question would be a good idea. So, yeah, I just thought it might be interesting with some of those knockout mice. To yeah, see. And, I, and I think it, it would have effects because you, you do, when you have things that are changing, especially the presynaptic function, if you, if you manipulate it with a high frequency, you can get at that question. But in terms of globally putting on glutamate antagonists or agonists, I, I haven't gone that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to ask another question because I just don't see anybody there, and uh, why not? 
So um, the ITCs are just fascinating. I, I really didn't know anything about them. And um, I'm wondering if in schizophrenia or, or autism or other things that are genetically connected, they've been looked at in postmortem studies. Is there, is there any morphological data, cellular data at all? No, isn't it amazing that, I mean, it doesn't it strike you is that this is something that should be played with, right? <laughs> sure. I now, mean, now I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and it just hasn't been, especially given that the weird D1 receptor manipulation. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I haven't found anyone that has looked at it. I'm, I should look more carefully, but I just haven't found it in, in the clinic. But they're there in, in humans as well. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, they're, they're kind of analogous to the reticular neurons in the balance in some in some ways, you know. Okay. But they just haven't been well studied. All right. Thanks. Um, this is a bit tall. Uh, may I ask a question about the, uh, the relationship? Because I'm in, really interested about the amygdala involved with the uh, uh, schizophrenia disease. Uh, how can you uh, integrate the amygdala to the uh, Dopamine D2, like it was dried term, because the main hypothesis, the old, old days, classic way, is that too much dopamine in the uh, stride term and uh, too little dopamine in the uh, front of uh, the cortex. So, yeah. how you think the, your, your research? Well, you know, it, I think, you know, it's first of all, they're integrated, right? In the mesolimbic system, it, you know, they, it's all part of that integrated circuit. And you know it's understudied how you know it's the, how the amygdala is affected. So that you don't maybe in five years you'll that that line will be there's too much mesolimbic dopamine in the, in the nucleus to come in. There's not enough in the prefrontal. There's too much in the amygdala, right? <laughs> we might hear that. So because they're not, yeah. you know, it's you know it's it just we're it's a work in progress. But I think it, you're, it would be integrated in that same way that you right. suggest. And they may have yeah. certain features, like these little odd shells, that make it more um, make a difference in the in the way it's gated, right? Maybe there's another question while we wait for Krista to connect that way. Um. Yeah. Actually, I had a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um. So. I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about the role that the gamma and theta frequencies play um, that you're observing in the, in the knockout mice. So the gamma differences that I quoted, I haven't measured in the mice. It's just being inferred that they would be important because they're important in the human and other people who have studied, you know, different models and different brain regions have seen decreased gamma rhythms um, in these mice. And so I would only have to answer it with respect to the general understanding of the functions of the gamma rhythms, which are partially in memory consolidation in terms of bi and binding different uh, thoughts in the brain together and having different brain regions be on the same and neuron classes be on the same wavelength per se by having the same time links. So just coordinating things, and that's what people kind of think rhythms are important for. Thank you. That's helpful. Sounds like it. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having me, thank Randy. You.